Thank you. Thank you, Xiang, for the introduction. And it's my pleasure to meet you all. And uh, let's uh, celebrate for this um, afternoon and with some of the good ideas and uh, introductions of what we have done for sustainability and for the research community. Uh, so if you, I just want to put uh, certain words and certain criteria of what we do and what we see in cloud-native sustainability, we probably can uh, use you know, a few characters, um, some colors to paint the picture. So I call it MC Cube. Uh, not to understand, not to confuse with MC square. Uh, so for M, I mean the metrics. So as we, um, many of you have known, the, for cloud native, it's observability that gives us a lot of power for scheduling, for, scale, for scaling, and for uh, a lot of uh, management on cost and uh, um, availability. So having enough met metrics will give you uh, the insights into what we, what, what we can do. So the metrics we build is for energy conservation. So specifically, we want to know how much energy consumed by your workloads uh, in cloud native, in Kubernetes, that means the part level, how much energy used by the node and by the parts. The second is what we call correlation. So having these metrics makes sense to the end user, but does not make use for the end user in terms of uh, doing the energy conservation. So when you schedule your workloads, how do you correlate with the metrics, with the hardware characteristics, such that the scheduling of your workloads will be optimized for uh, energy consumption? So after the scheduling, the workloads landed on the nodes. It keeps running for days and weeks and even for months. If any of the original assumption about the resource, consumption, uh, resource assignments goes wrong, how do you correct this runtime behavior? So we call this as a correction phase. In this phase, we use an auto-scaling capabilities uh, in the Kubernetes community. As the very last one, once you go beyond a single cluster, you want to take into account of the carbon um, deltas around the world between different clusters. That is where the multi-clusters use case comes in, and we want to account for the carbon intensity uh, differences in between multiple clusters and find the best destinations for your workloads to land on. Um, let's come down to the uh, projects we are trying to, uh, the problem with the, our projects is trying to address. The projects in, uh, the problems in the cloud native um, uh, power management is that, uh, first of all, you want to have accuracy. Right? Accuracy means the uh, metrics we presented to you about the parts, about the containers, are as accurate as we can see. Everybody will agree on the methodology, everybody will agree on the end results. That's the way we want to achieve. The second level is the fairness. As you all know, that's a, having something accountable on a shared operating system is not so easy, right? So it's just like the same way you live in the condominiums, you pay the management fee. You have to account for every of the usage by the per square feet by each of the tenants. But there are shared areas in the lobbies, the swimming pools. How do you account for this uh, shared area? So this, um, uh, the fairness we want to take into account is in the methodology. So when we present the numbers, they are represent, they repre the representation will reflect the, uh, the ideas, uh, the fairness, the accuracy we want to tell the end customer. The very last one is the uh, multiple granularities uh, you want to present the information. Not every, you know, for developers who are interested in developing uh, um, wonderful applications, they will focus on the process, right? The running process will tell a lot of story about how efficiency the, um, the, the application is. But for the containers, you are talking about the uh, container level, the part level, and for deployment level, there's multiple layers of uh, aggregations. And for end users, maybe like a, a system admins, they worry about the tenants, the name space level. How do you get the information from all these levels to all different personas? So we want to have all these things get you into account in the projects when we build up the projects. Um, so for capital projects, if you have already seen the projects, uh, the name actually stands for the uh, Cap uh, Kubernetes Efficient Power Level Exporter. It makes sense to us, as you know, the NASA telescope uh, Kepler. It gives you the insights into the, um, the universe. We want to have the insights into the universe of the uh, Kubernetes community. So the Kepler has three goals in mind. One is the reporting, as I said. You want to have the capabilities to tell the customers, the end users, developers, how much energy used by the parts on different levels of uh, you know, the electronics, the components, uh, CPU, DRAM, uh, GPU, and eventually going beyond uh, that level to FPGA, and uh, almost like a networking, it could be the next one. 
So we also want to use the uh, capabilities of running Kepler across the, um, across the hybrid cloud environments. You want, we want it to run on bare metal machines, on your private clouds, on your data center, and we also want the Kepler to run on hyperscalers, on um, EC2, you know, Azure, and GCP. On these environments, most of the, um, the runtime uh, computation form is virtual machines, so we want the model to be a port as a portable as across the different subspections. And we also support the Prometheus. And that's the, you know, if you are going to the keynotes, the Prometheus becomes a lot of, a, a lot of a, um, you know, gets a lot of love by the community. So we want to support the Prometheus level X14. Um, if you are getting all these resources and you want to get all the details, it seems like this is a, a very over, a heavy task. So we want to reduce the footprint of capital projects itself. We do not want to consume too much resources, too much CPUs, too much DRAMs. As a matter of fact, you know, to our observation, we usually stay at 2% of the CPU level and 40 megabytes of memory, so it's very less weighted. Um, we do not want to introduce our own methodology. I mean, we do not want to invent something that any customers have no visibility into, so we are taking into account of the scientific research uh, over the last two decades. I put over the two code here, so if you have interest, you can just uh, take a look into the research papers, what the formula is about. I'll just give you one example of one of the linear regression formulas, how to take into account of the CPU uh, usage, the performance counters, and measure the, CPU, uh, you, um, the power consumption by the CPUs. But this is not the formula we are using. As a matter of fact, if you are going to the next slide, so this is our architecture. So we have three layers, or actually we have three columns. So if you come from the very uh, end of the, on the left, we have the eBPF, that's where it collects the information from the, universe, uh, from the kernel level. The information includes the CPU instructions, the, uh, the cycles, and um, uh, the um, uh, CPU time, and also process and container correlation. And we pump this information up to the user space. The user space will get yet another layers of information, and like the, the CPU uh, power consumption, that if you are running on uh, x86 platforms, you have the REPL, runtime average power level. That's will tell you different domains, how much uh, electricity, how much, how much power consumed by each, each of the uh, CPU or DRAMs and on a different time. And we also collect C stats, C group stats uh, from the C groups, and we also collect information from Kubernetes. So we put all this information together and we use the machine learning models to predict how much power used by different um, you know, of these uh, uh, processes and containers and parts. So that is our methodology. So we are not, dictated, we are not uh, dictating the eventual uh, model. We will ask the customer to build the model on your site. So that will be a true representation of how much power used by your environment, by your workloads. Uh, so this is the one of the dashboards we, can, uh, we are using, thanks to all the community contributors from, from here. And uh, we are trying to give you some uh, intuitions how much carbon footprint this, uh, gen uh, your workload will generate, and uh, what's the variations over time your workloads on different of the components on CPU, on DRAM, on GPU. And we also keep you a certain rankings as different uh, namespace level. With this matrix, that's a uh, unlimited potential, how much information you can build up for your final uh, visualization. And we also want to introduce yet another project by Chen. He has built up the, this wonderful project called, uh, called Clever using the matrix. And before she comes in, I want to give the community a shout out. So over the time, this project has been contributed by different people representing from different companies. And we really appreciate their help in shaping up the projects and giving us the feedbacks and even contributing code to the project. So because we have um, Kepler in place, we can have all types of observabilities uh, in terms of getting the energy uh, related metrics, including energy consumption for different components of your uh, uh, workload, right? Including CPU, memory, and you can also understand what is the current frequencies of your CPU and then whether you have uh, tuned down the frequency to uh, save energy. So uh, here, I just want to give an example on like how we can leverage Kepler to do some optimizations on your cluster so you can both reduce your energy consumptions as well as uh, guarantee your performance of the workload. 
So um, the question we try to answer here uh, is uh, when the frequency tuning knobs, there's a lot of frequency tuning knobs available in the Kubernetes community. And then when you increase or decrease CPU frequencies, and then how you can guarantee the performance of the workload. So before that, let, let me introduce a little bit uh, the background about the vertical pod autoscaler on Kubernetes. So um, the, the vertical pod autoscaler on Kubernetes uh, in, includes three different controllers uh, called recommender, updater, and admission controller. So what it does, it, it tries to get some usage, usage data for your workload, and then um, try to understand, do some analysis on the usage data, and try to resize your pod according to your actual usage. And then all our work is built upon this framework, and then and uh, early uh, last year, we have contributed some uh, feature to this uh, VPA on Kubernetes, which allows you to customize any algorithms to use VPA uh, by changing the recommender by your own recommender. So based on this feature, what we can do is a clever recommender. So the clever recommender is trying to guarantee the whole performance of the workload when you try to reduce energy consumptions of your whole cluster by uh, lowering your uh, CPU frequencies. And then um, how do we do that? So let's assume you have something like a, a tuner, frequency tuner to update the CPU or GPU frequencies according to any target or metric or, you, or your energy consumption budget. And then when you lower down the frequencies, intuitively the, your performance of the workload will decrease. And then what we can do is we can obtain like the status of the workload, the cluster state of the workload, the CPU frequencies from nodes where the, the frequency are changed based on Kepler exported metrics. And in this way, we know there's something change, changes in your cluster on your node, your workload would be impacted. Then how, how can we guarantee the performance? When the frequency is down, your performance is down, especially when it's for the computational intensive workload, uh, then the total instructions per second you can get will be down. Then the recommender, what the recommender does is we develop a recommender called Clever and it can trigger to resize your pod to either increase or decrease accordingly to your frequency change to guarantee you get the similar performance for your workload. And then when you use the Clever recommender working with all other controllers in the vertical pod autoscaler, the VP updater and admission controller will go ahead and resize your pod to guarantee you have the same performance. So the idea is like, like, let's take the computational intensive workload, for example, and the URLA, the, the, the most important metric you are watching is uh, the instructions per second. And if you look at IPIS formula, it's related to your frequency of the CPU, your allocation of the resources on CPU, and something like the, the, uh, the average number of circles per instruction. And then if you want to target the particular IPS here, and then you would have a default request on that, assuming you, ha you have the CPU in full, uh, the maximum frequency running in the full capacity. And then when you tune down the frequencies, and then you will derive a current IPS. And what the uh, Clever project is doing is trying to force the IPS target equals to IPS current. And then you later find out it's not related to the number of average cycles per, per instruction. And the, the, the current request that you should tune to is only related to the maximum frequency, your current frequency, and your default request. So this is how Clever is deriving the uh, the, 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 the targeted request value for your part to guarantee the same performance. And then uh, next I will show a simple demo on how we deploy Kepler in a cluster, what the Kepler, how we deploy the Kepler dashboard, and then we will go ahead and deploy uh, the Kubernetes default vertical pod autoscaler and deploy the Clever recommender, run the testing workload using the default VPA together with the Clever recommender to ensure the uh, performance of the pod. 
And you can scan the barcode of those two to get the more detailed information of Kepler and Clever. So now we are in a Kubernetes cluster with one node and then uh, we already pre-installed all the Prometheus and Grafana support. Uh, what we are going to do is we first go to the Kepler project. We clone the, um, so there are a lot of documentations on how to use it. Basically it's just one clay to install. And we clone the, the repo. What we are going to do next is we will uh, check out a stable release for Kepler project. Let's pick up the release uh, 0.3. And at the same time, let's um, forward the part of, uh, uh, do the cube forward, a uh, part forward to get the Prometheus UI and Grafana UI to localhost. And now we are in the Prometheus UI. We just uh, try one of the default metric to see if it's working. The way we deploy uh, Kepler is very simple. We have a, a YAML already available under the manifest for both Kubernetes and OpenShift. And the YAML include all the necessary RBAC rows and um, service account to, cr to create for uh, Kepler deployment. And it, it includes the daemon side for the Kepler exporter. So we go ahead to create Kepler and deploy Kepler daemon side for all the nodes in the cluster. And you can also check um, if the Kepler daemon site is running. Okay, now it's running. Um, just for, um, for exporting all the metrics to Prometheus, we go ahead to create a, a customer resource called Service Monitor to actually expose the Kepler endpoint to script the Kepler endpoint for all the data. And that YAML also includes all the RBAC rules we need um, access to Prometheus. And you can configure the interval of the scraping um, in the service monitor CR as well. We can double check if the service monitor resources is successfully created under the Kepler namespace. And you can also uh, check from the Prometheus AI whether uh, the Kepler service uh, monitor endpoint is available. It takes some time for it to be up. And uh, the other way you can also check the um, Kepler uh, service endpoint uh, to get whether it's on or not. And the port number is um, 9102. Now we can see all, all, all the, the Prometheus is starting uh, scraping the data from the Kepler endpoint. Let's go and load the Kepler exporter dashboard and the dashboard is already, uh, also available in the GitHub repo. There is a folder called uh, Grafana dashboard. You can import it in the dashboard. You can quantify. You can see the uh, like the equivalent uh, CO2 uh, amount and uh, petroleum amount uh, of energy consumptions 
for, for a particular part. And then it also, also shows uh, the energy consumption for different components over time. And then uh, it also accumulated the energy consumption for different name, namespace of your workload. So the next step is let's go ahead, uh, install the default uh, Kubernetes vertical pod autoscaler. It's just two steps. The first one is we want to clone the autoscaler repo. Okay, make sure you uh, CD into the folder of a vertical pod autoscaler. And then what it takes is uh, using their default script, which is hack.vpa app, then you install all the controllers for the VPA. And the support of alternative recommenders uh, for VPA is already upstream. So anyone using the default uh, VPA controllers can develop your own recommender, can use your own recommender together with the existing VPA. Okay, now all the three VPA controllers are running. Then, then we want to clone the project of Clever. Clever is just written in a, a simple code VPA recommender written in Python, and uh, it's less than 200 lines of code, and then you can take a look and write your own recommender as well. Um, the way to deploy it is very simple. We already prepared the manifest file for that. So let's go ahead, clone the repo. And uh, the Clever YAML includes all the necessary deployment, cluster roles, um, cluster role binding, and service account. And the only thing you want to configure is the environment variable of premises host, and then let's use the default endpoint here. So it will get all the necessary metrics from, the, uh, from premises, uh, from also Kepler exporter. Okay, then the Clever recommender is running. And let's double check if, if it's running in the same namespace as the VPA controllers. Just for debugging purpose, we here open another window to show all the log messages from Clever. Okay, so the next step we are going to test is we want to create a workload uh, using the, uh, all the VPA and using Clever as the customized recommender for the VPA. And uh, for any workload. So now if we go back to see the, uh, the Clever dashboard, and in the Clever dashboard, we will show like something like what is the current frequencies of the node, the maximum, minimum frequencies of the node. And this dashboard is also available on the Clever project um, repo. And you see, currently we have one node, the maximum frequencies is four gigahertz, and the current frequency is almost at four, and the minimum frequency, frequency of the CPU you can tune to is one gigahertz. Then let's go ahead to take a look at the um, sample sysbench workload we want to test. Uh, it's just creating a, a CPU intensive workload, taking the whole, um, try to taking the whole CPUs, but we set the request and limit uh, for the CPU as 250 millicores. So it can only use, use one quarter of the CPU. And then uh, if we go ahead and create the workload, we see 
Uh, by the way, in order to use the, the VPA, you probably want to have more than two replicas uh, to be running at the same time, so you don't lose the high availability of your workload. And if we refresh and we, um, the data will pop up in a minute. Um, and the second window shows the, uh, the current CPU request of the workload. The third one shows the instructions per second performance metric for the workload. By the way, the IPS metric is also available in Kepler. So if you install Kepler, you can not only see the energy consumption metrics, but all types of performance metrics for your, um, for your workload. It is using eBPF, so it's very lightweight. So what we are going to do next is we will uh, run a simple script trying to uh, attune the frequencies on the node to like uh, two gigahertz. Right now it's almost a four gigahertz. We want to tune it down to the two gigahertz so we save um, like 30 to 40% of the energy for the node. Okay. Then let's watch the um, recommended value for the um, for the VPA we created. By the way, when you want to use an alternative recommender uh, for your workload in the VPA object, you can specify uh, the name of your recommender by using recommenders keyword uh, in your VPA uh, YAML. Now the the, the, the default. Um, value is still 250. Uh, let's wait a mo moment for Kepler to get the actual frequencies of the, um, now the actual frequencies are already drops, right? You see the, the, the top window, the frequency drops from almost four to two gigahertz. And then at the same time, the IPIs drops for the workload. And it will take a while for the VPA to kick in um, and there's some log messages popping up. The last message, uh, the, uh, the, the recommender shows it's still taking uh, four gigahertz of the, okay. No, now the VPA already recommend 500 millicores for the workload. And And we see the request value. So I actually, I cut off a little bit because it takes a long time, uh, like one minute for the for the power to be resized. And let's go back a little bit to see it here. You see. So, so actually when we tuned the frequency down, uh, the IPS drops for a while, but the VPIC and Clever controllers kick in to increase the allocation of the CPU and equivalently we will keep the same IPS over time. This is how Clever uh, utilizing the Kepler metrics to uh, guarantee you have the same performance as well as saving some energy. Okay, so uh, looking forward, uh, we will uh, try to enhance the whole Kepler uh, project with uh, some carbon footprint output. Uh, we will uh, in 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 try to increase the model to be uh, available for both uh, physical machines and VMs. And uh, uh, so Kwame will handle the other projects that are going on. Thank you. So this is my observation. So uh, we have seen a lot of wonderful scaling mechanisms uh, for performance for resource, um, but we have never seen something to scale for the purpose of energy conservation without disrupting your service. And I think this is one of the greatest achievements uh, for this uh, integration. Thank you, Chen, for this uh, uh, huge contribution. Uh, so looking forward, uh, we believe Kepler and integrated with other ecosystems, with other metrics, we can make bigger things happen. So 
uh, going back as we said earlier, uh, we want to address a certain things in sustainability, carbon, energy, water, and waste. So these are topics we believe um, we can make uh, contributions as a, um, as a team, as a community. Uh, I'm not going to dictate what is the most efficient way, so what's the best solutions, but I want to keep the um, questions open so for the whole community we can build up the better solutions for the better tomorrow. And uh, I want to also want to give a shout out. Um, so because uh, during the process of uh, preparing for uh, KubeCon and for other community-based uh, developments, we have uh, have a uh, lot of inputs from um, uh, the communities like Akita. Uh, we are discussing bootstrapping mechanisms to auto scaling based on carbon intensity, and we potentially can also use the same mechanisms to build up even high impact uh, auto scaling mechanisms for service workloads for auto scaling. Uh, so we'll take both uh, energy and the carbon into account so we can reduce the energy and the carbon footprints with high impact workloads. And that's all we have for this presentation. Uh, thank you for attending. Um, we are like to open. Uh, so thank you for the presentation. <laughs> and any question? We do have a time for two questions. Yeah, please uh, just raise the hand and I will give you the mic. Thanks. Uh, this talk was great, and I really love to see where this work is going. Um, just a question on how you're sort of thinking about energy beyond just the CPU. So, like, obviously, you know, if you're using a cloud provider, they have to power, you know, everything in the box, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. In some ways, it can make more sense to bin pack denser nodes because you amortize the cost of things like NICs over sort of more containers, right? So how do you sort of juggle that? Yeah, so uh, if I understand correctly, so one is the question is about the, uh, the, uh, the components, like the CPU, and the other one is like the type of workloads. So uh, just uh, let me ask you the first question, and then maybe you can help, with, help me with the second question about the type of workloads. So I think uh, you are definitely right. Uh, we are targeting CPU a lot in this presentation. Uh, one of the reasons is that the CPU actually accounts for 60% of the whole energy consumption of the server. I mean, relatively speaking, because if you have a huge amounts of RAM, that could be, the number could be a vary. But a CPU is the, definitely one of the, those things. The other workload is the GPU. Uh, we also have the GPU capabilities, the, the metrics we can report. Uh, the challenge with GPU is that uh, the frequency and eventually QoS are hard to define. Like CPU can define this um, uh, uh, instruction per cycle. GPU you probably have different metrics. It's very hard to define. If we know what's the metrics we can use, we can build that into a, yet another exporter, and a capital could provide the energy information, and you probably can provide this uh, usability metrics, and we can correlate with each other, and you can build up yet another um, VPA based on the new metrics. And for the type of workload, maybe Chen can. Now, she knows much better about scheduling and uh, scaling than I do. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, definitely. We were thinking about like, why don't we just pack all the workload on a smaller number of nodes so we can turn other nodes off to overall save energy consumption. Uh, but that doesn't work for all types of workload. For certain workload, like especially like telco workload, <laughs> some, uh, uh, someone in the community might answer it better, but you need to keep the machine on all the time, but the workload you get is really fluctuating a lot. And then you cannot really move because you have to have a location that there is a server there uh, doing the job. And then in this case, if we, if we can tune down the frequency, and then save, overall save a lot of energy, uh, as well as guarantee the, the performance of the workload. Uh, that helps a lot. So uh, not all the workload can be packed or migrated. In the data center case, yes it is, but in a lot of other cases, it's not. Uh, any other question? One, one more. Okay, this gentleman. Thank you for the awesome share. So I have a question regarding the query clever uh, project. So after I change the CPU frequency, usually how long will it take effect, uh, to update the resource? Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. So it, it, it takes a while in our current setting because we kind of like checking the um, frequency changes only every minute 
to reduce the resource consumptions of Clever. And if you want, you can just increase a little bit uh, the frequency. You can tune it to 10 seconds, 5 seconds, whatever. Um, as it is needed, because in our case, it's like uh, the frequency, we don't tune frequency that frequently, so one minute interval would be fine, but it's configurable. Okay, thank you. Thank you for everyone and Lata M for the first session in the research and academic track. 20 minutes after, we will stay here for the second presentation. Thank you all, okay, thank you.